Okay, well, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Stephen Taylor, who his name and the Pulsar Timing Rays have come up quite a bit already this summer school. But Steve is a assistant professor at Vanderbilt University, uh, an ex expert in gravitational wave astrophysics and uh, detecting gravitational waves with pulsar timing rays. So he's gonna give us a series of two lectures on that. And this afternoon, a hands-on session on uh, using the enterprise code, which he'll explain more later. So please take it away, Steve. Thanks for being here. Brilliant. Thanks, Dan. And thanks, uh, Johan and Martin and the other organizers as well. Uh, it's really a pleasure to virtually uh, attend the summer school and, uh, and talk to you all. I'm envious that you're all there in person, but uh, hopefully we can connect uh, afterwards as well. So yes, Dan said that uh, I'd give you an overview of pulsar timing arrays and I'll have some slides, but I also have some uh, real-time derivations of some key quantities that I want to show you. Uh, and so you can see where they come from. They're pretty straightforward. They'll be pencil and paper, either real or digital. Um, and they, they shouldn't last longer than the, the session itself. So first of all, just to orient you in the landscape of gravitational waves, obviously up here at higher frequencies, we've got the ground-based detectors. Uh, down here at mid frequencies, we've got what will be occupied by LISA. And then at lower frequencies still, we've got the nanohertz to 100 nanohertz range of frequencies, which is where pulsar timing arrays operate. Pulsar timing arrays are thus sensitive to gravitational wave periods of years to decades. This is a very low frequency experiment. Hence, you know, the action can move very, very slowly. Um, it's not on the ground-based detector time scale where, where things are in band for a couple of hundred milliseconds. Um, we're really looking at significance growing slowly over years. Um, but you know, the good thing, the good news for you is that the, the action has started to heat up. And so you don't need to wait years and decades. Uh, things are starting to look very exciting right now. All right, so first of all, pulsars. I'm going to guess that you all know what pulsars are. They are these rapidly rotating neutron stars um, with uh, misaligned magnetic and rotational field axes. They emit radiation beams along their magnetic field axes. And thus, whenever that beam is swung into our line of sight, uh, our radio telescopes on Earth measure a pulse of radiation. So the time between subsequent pulses is very simply related to the, the rotational period of the pulsar. Now there are a whole host of other factors as well that determine the arrival times of these radio pulses. And I'll get into that in a, in a few minutes, but this is a very simple picture um, that you can, can see here for how we can time these pulsars and build up very sophisticated models of, uh, of the pulse times of arrival. Um, now, an important thing to point out is that we're not looking for gravitational waves from pulsars. Um, Ground-based detectors are looking for pulsar mountains and the kind of small quadrupole moment that those pulsar mountains can, can create and thus they would source gravitational waves. For us, pulsars are just a part of our detector. We're using them as one end of our sort of large interferometer experiment. Uh, we've got a a selection of these uh, pulsars throughout the Milky Way that we're, that we're timing and using as part of our detector. Um, now, one of the great things is that, you know, nature has provided us with um, a really exquisitely timed astrophysical object uh, that we can use as part of our detection apparatus. The downside is that we can't go out to the pulsar and tear it apart and find out what's going on inside. Uh, we can't do the kind of rigorous um, noise mitigation that ground-based detectors can do where you know exactly what's going on in each part of your detector. For us, it's more that we're building effective models for the noise processes in the pulsar. And we're trying to push that off to one side, mitigate it so that we can cleanly separate any presence of gravitational wave signals. And I'll get into that more once we look at the enterprise tutorial later today. So there are broadly two classes of pulsars that that exist in nature. The, the first discovered pulsars back just over 50 years ago uh, by Jocelyn and Val Burnell uh, were canonical pulsars. They're now known as canonical pulsars. And uh, they typically have rotational periods of about a second. Um, however, they tend to be um, less stable on long time scales in their rotation. Uh, they're more, more prone to glitches. And so they're not what we actually use for our precision time and experiments. What we actually use are millisecond pulsars, which were discovered in the early 80s. And these are pulsars that 
um, we think have been stabilized and spun up through accretion of material from a companion star. What that does is it suppresses the magnetic field of the pulsar. Um, it also spins it up to higher rotational uh, frequencies, and it seems to stabilize it quite well. So it's got longer timescale stability than the canonical pulsars. So those are the ones we use, and they're down here at obviously millisecond periods and lower period derivatives as well. Now, here's a really uh, over the top uh, uh, picture of a pulsar timing experiment where you've got the Earth here, giant radio telescope, and then a pulsar somewhere out in the galaxy. As the pulsar rotates and sends out its beam of radiation, we measure a pulse train at the Earth, and we can build up a very sophisticated timing model for each pulsar. That will depend on the spin period of the pulsar, um, the rate at which it's spinning down, because the, the electromagnetic outflow is tapping into the rotational energy of the pulsar, and so the pulsar is actually spinning down. Its period is getting larger over time. We need to factor that in. Um, the model will also have to take into account the pulsar's position on the sky, so there are astrometric effects. We also have to account for the fact that these are radio pulses propagating through an ionized interstellar medium, and so we'll get some radio frequency dependent delays of our pulses. Our pulse, uh, our pulse will actually separate into components where you'll get um, uh, lower radio frequencies being delayed longer than higher radio frequencies, and that has to be um, very carefully taken into account whenever we measure the pulsars, uh, measure the pulses on Earth. Now, it's a leading order what these timing models don't take into account is the influence of a gravitational wave. What a gravitational wave do uh, will do is, if it's coming from some exterior source outside of the galaxy, um, it will change the proper separation between the Earth and the pulsar. It will cause these, you know, uh, compressions and expansions of the space-time change in the proper separation, which means that our pulses will either arrive ahead of or behind schedule. Um, so we get these pulse timing deviations away from our best fit models, and we can look within those timing deviations for the presence of gravitational waves. That's really the key to all of this. Um, so if we were, to, we were to look in one pulsar for gravitational waves, uh, we would look at the pulse train, we would fit out a best fit timing model. And then we would look at the timing residuals and the structure within those for the presence of gravitational waves. Now, this is not what we actually do um, because pulsars themselves have these complicated noise processes that we have to filter out, um, which means that we could never unambiguously claim that there were gravitational waves in the time series of one pulsar. Um, we would not be able to do that. Instead, we use a, uh, an array of pulsars, and we use the fact that the gravitational waves induce correlated timing deviations between all of the pulsars with a very distinctive signature. And I'll get into that um, in, the, uh, in the second lecture. So I want to actually show you where this derivation of uh, the timing deviations come from. I think it's instructive to look at that. So I'm going to shift over to my, um, my virtual whiteboard. I'll show you where this comes from. Okay, you should all hopefully be seeing kind of a black screen with a grid on it. All right, so we're looking at the timing response to gravitational waves for pulsars. We've got our picture here where we've got a pulsar sending out beams of radiation. We've got the Earth over here with our giant radio telescope on it. And let's imagine we've got this pulse train headed towards Earth. But also affecting this pulse train is a, a transiting gravitational wave signal. So imagine we've got wave fronts, which are coming across and interacting with this system. So the gravitational wave is propagating this way. All right, and we're going to use a gravitational line element that's very simple. You might've seen it earlier in the week. 
This is mostly Minkowski space time with a small perturbation. And uh, we're going to work in the TT gauge. Okay, very simple line element here. And in the following, I'm going to say that A and B are spatial components of the metric tensor. And then I, J are different pulsars. All right, and if, if this is going too fast, don't worry, all of these notes and, and lecture materials will be up online afterwards. All right, so we're looking at a photon path. We're going to look at how the gravitational wave affects a photon path, which means that I can set the space-time interval to zero. If I do, then I've got zero equals minus dt squared plus and then I'm going to operate in the regime where the gravitational wave is just moving along the x-axis of our coordinate system, which makes things a lot easier. We'll generalize later on. Okay. Is there a question on the chat? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, yeah, we can operate in the assumption of a plane wave front. So the gravitational wave is coming from um, extra galactic sources. So 10, you know, hundreds of megaparsecs away. These are, these are very distant sources and our detectors are inside the Milky Way. So we, we can operate in the assumption that we've got a plane away from. Steve, um, there are some- Could you just repeat the question? Go ahead. Could you just repeat? Yes, the... of course. Thank you. Yes, uh, the question was at these scales, can we still assume the wave to have a straight wavefront instead of an elliptical wavefront? And so what I was saying uh, was that for most sources, we can assume that we've got a plane wavefront uh, because these are coming from very distant uh, gravitational wave sources compared to the scale of our detector, which is located inside the Milky Way. Um, now, Dan, you've done some work recently with, with Casey McGrath and others um, to, to generalize this to elliptical wavefronts. Um, but for most of our purposes, we can assume that we've got a plane wavefront. All right, so we've got a very simple line element here. We've got a gravitational wave propagating along the x-axis. Let's just tidy this up a bit. dx squared, one plus htx. Oh, and if I didn't say it before, we're using g equals c equals one in all of this. All right, so there's my dx squared. I've just brought it to the other side of the equation and, uh, and then brought the one plus h um, onto the dt side. Now I'm going to assume that this is a very small metric perturbation. So dx is approximately one minus a half htx. And also I'm going to assume that the gravitational wave is moving towards the origin. So dx is getting smaller. Now let's assume that we've got an earth pulsar distance L, and these are typically going to be on the scale of kiloparsecs. Let's directly integrate this equation and see what we get. So I'm going from the position of the pulsar to the position of the earth, which is minus L. And then the time goes from the emitted time to the observed time. Okay, just tidying this up a bit gives L equals T observed minus T emitted minus this integral quantity here. All right, so that's the first equation uh, that we needed in all of this. 
we're going to further make the assumption um, or further impose the assumption that HTT XX is very small, much, much less than one for all of this, which means that for most of our calculations, we can make the, the, the approximation that the observed time is roughly equal to the emitted time plus the light travel lag time between the Earth and the pulsar. And since I'm setting C to be equal to one here, that's just L. Now, a byproduct of this is that I can assume that for most, uh, for most of my equations, my photon path is not going to be deflected. Um, the, the timing properties will be, will be deviated, but the path itself is mostly unperturbed um, as it's propagating. And the unperturbed trajectory X is just going to be T observe minus T given time T. And then P is a unit vector pointing at my pulsar. Now, all of this has been under the assumption that I've got gravitational waves propagating along the x-axis, but we want to generalize to any kind of geometry. So to do that, all I need to do is replace HTT of x with PA, PB, HTT, AB. Okay, where P is the unit vector pointing uh, to my pulsar. So finally, for the first pulse that I'm looking at, I can write the observed time of that pulse is equal to the emitted time plus L plus PA, PB over two. And then I've got this, what looks like a nasty integral, but it actually turns out to be okay. Now that would usually be T observed up at the top, the, the limit of the integral up at the top, but I'm going to replace that with T emitted plus L using the approximation from the previous slide. Okay, and everything inside that square bracket is just um, something that the, the metric perturbation depends on. So it'll be P prime and then the X the X uh, factor. And uh, Steve, just a quick clarification question uh, from the chat. Sure. The unit vectors between pulsar and Earth? Or... Yes, that's right. P is, the, P is a unit vector pointing to the position of the pulsar from, uh, from the Earth. All right, so we've got the observed time of our first pulse. We're now, we now just need to do this one more time to get a second pulse and then look at what the, uh, what the time difference is between those pulses and how it's affected by the presence of the gravitational wave. Okay, so we're looking at a second pulse here. It's emitted one rotational period after the first pulse. So it's very easy to write this down, at least on the, on the pulsar side of things, because it's emitted um, a time P after the first pulse. So T prime is equal to T emitted plus P. So capital P is going to be the rotational period of my pulsar. And T prime emitted and T prime observed, they're going to be the corresponding T emitted and T observed of my second pulse. Okay, I'm gonna move on. All I need to do now is then replace T emitted with T emitted plus P in my previous equation for the observed time of the first pulse. 
and then simplify down, simplify down a little bit. So the observed time of the second pulse is equal to the emitted time of the first pulse plus a rotational period plus the light travel lag time. And then we've got the gravitational wave bit that we had in the first pulse as well. So we've got these projection factors, PA, PB, those are lower case P corresponding to the unit vector uh, of the pulsar. And then I'm just going to change the limits of my integration to correspond to the second pulse. So those limits of integration, it's a little bit too small to see. Um, down at the bottom here, it's T emitted plus P. Up at the top, it's T emitted plus P plus L. And then I'm just filling in the factors of my metric perturbation now. I'm using double prime in this, uh, in this second pulse integral to make it different, um, to make the dummy sort of integration variable different from what it was before uh, and distinct from the, the primes for this second pulse. Okay, so we're almost there for our second pulse. Now I'm just going to redefine my variables to make the integration appear in a little more simplified form. So I'm going to introduce further variable triple prime, which is going to be T prime prime minus P. This will mean T obs prime is equal to T E M plus P plus L. A lot of this is just replicated in the equation above. So for that, I get to cheat a bit by copying some of the equation bits. And then I'm changing my limits of integration that correspond to this new um, this new variable here. So that's going from T emitted up to T emitted plus L. And then the time is going to be T triple prime, prime plus P. Move things over a bit, running out of space. All right, so that's the equation we need for the second pulse. It gives us the observed time of the second pulse. Now, as you might expect, we just take the difference. We take the difference in the observed time um, of the pulse of the Earth corresponding to the first and the second pulse. We just look at the time difference um, in the measured arrivals of those uh, two pulses. I'll give people another few seconds to write down in case, uh, in case that went fast. All right, so <clears throat> what we really want is the observed time of the second pulse minus the observed time 
of that first pulse. If there were no gravitational waves present, that would just be P, okay? It's the difference of one rotational period of the pulsar. But we do have gravitational waves present, and those gravitational waves are stretching and squeezing space-time and changing the, the perceived arrival times of those pulses. So we get this additional factor with gravitational wave components in it. Okay, so that should be very simple to, to parse and understand where this is coming from. So this is the you know, metric perturbation bit affecting the second pulse, and then you're subtracting the metric perturbation bit that's affecting the first pulse. And they're really only different by how the metric perturbation is evolving over rotational period of the pulsar. And this bit over here, is our delta P. So this is the perceived, perceived shift to the, um, so the rotational period of the pulsar uh, or the perceived shift to the arrival times of the pulses uh, as influenced by gravitational waves. Now, I said that this was only different by how the metric perturbation is changing over a rotational period of the pulsar. Um, so we're only different by P here. This is clearly, a very, very small shift because the periods of our pulsars are of order milliseconds. <clears throat> Whereas the periods of the gravitational waves that we're hunting are of order nanohertz. So just by the back of the envelope calculation, we've got a difference in the time scales of quantities we care about by 12, or 12 orders of magnitude. So clearly the metric perturbation is not changing that much over one rotational period, which means that we can take this metric perturbation or we can tailor expand it around the original metric perturbation at the first pulse. Okay, so I'm just Taylor expanding this metric perturbation. And that's just H at the original time plus the partial derivative of the metric perturbation with respect to time multiplied by our little delta T, which is the rotational period of the pulsar. Uh, there's a question on the chat. Why are we only considering nanosecond uh, gravitational waves? We're considering, we're considering nanohertz gravitational waves. Um, the reason why we're probing that region is because we can observe, we're, we're sensitive to gravitational waves and pulsar timing based on how we sample the time series of these pulses, okay? So if you consider time series analysis or signal process in theory, if you've got a stretch of time T and you do a Fourier analysis on that time series, you can probe down to frequencies of one over T, okay? So we've observed pulsars, millisecond pulsars, in a precise way for about one or two decades. 
That means that we can probe down to frequencies of one over a couple of decades, which corresponds to a few nanohertz. The highest frequency we can probe is set by how often we sample the time series of these pulsars. And we typically go back to pulsars every couple of weeks and take new data, which means that we can get up to something called the Nyquist sampling frequency, uh, which corresponds to roughly one over the time difference between observations. So one over a few weeks corresponds to a few hundred nanohertz. So that sets the boundary of where we're observing gravitational waves between a few nanohertz and a few hundred nanohertz. That's a really good question. All right, so I've got my Taylor expanded um, metric perturbation. Let's now just, I'm going to save a lot of work here and just plug this in so we can see what delta P divided by P is. So I'm only taking the gravitational wave part of that previous equation there. And all throughout, I've said that we've, we're evaluating things at a position x equals x naught. To write that out explicitly, got x naught equals t emitted plus l minus t prime along the unit vector position of the pulsar. Okay, because we're imagining that that uh, the position of the pulsar and the photon path is basically unperturbed by the gravitational waves. Okay, so this is basically the important equation we've got. The perceived shift to the rotational period of the pulsar that we're seeing um, is related to an integral of a partial derivative of the metric perturbation. To see this in a more instructive way, I'm going to plug in a monochromatic gravitational wave signal that. Uh, That'll just slot in here as our metric perturbation. So monochromatic gravitational wave signal, very easy to write down. Got some sort of amplitude tensor here, which will depend on the way, depend on the position that the gravitational wave is propagating towards. And then my time dependence is just going to be some sort of omega t minus omega dot x. Okay, so very simple, just a single frequency gravitational wave. If I plug that into my delta p over p equation, I'm gonna jump ahead in the math a little bit here and show you what this looks like for the sake of time. But it's pretty simple to just do the, the intermediate stages yourself. Notice I've got this new factor. So by taking the integral and factors in the metric perturbation itself, that additional set of factors is one plus omega dot p. Okay, so we've got an additional kind of directional dependence here. This corresponds to our original directional dependence, but then monochromatic gravitational waves brought down an additional dependence here. And this will be very important because essentially this is your detector response function for pulsar time and gravitational wave searches. Okay, then adding in the additional time dependence here, got cosine omega GW T obs minus cosine omega GW T emitted minus L omega dot P. 
Now again, omega is the direction of propagation of the gravitational waves. Whereas P is the unit vector pointing towards the pulsar. Now notice something really important here. The perceived shift to the rotational period of the pulsar is dependent on the arrival time at Earth through T obs, but it's also dependent on the emitted time of the original pulses. So there's clearly going to be some imprint of the gravitational wave at the time at which it passed the pulsar, and then another imprint at a later time at which the gravitational wave is currently passing Earth. So this is really important. I'm gonna point this out in just a second that we, we can essentially, even though we're only looking at snapshots of, of pulsars that last a few decades, as I said before, we get imprints of gravitational wave signals that go back actually thousands of years because we're able to look at signatures of when the gravitational wave originally passed all of the pulsars in our array. So it's kind of a form of temporal aperture synthesis. So finally, we can write down kind of a redshift quantity, which is a redshift to the pulse arrival rate, which will depend on time and in the direction of propagation of the gravitational waves. That's just going to be delta P over P, or I can write that down as well as in terms of the rotational frequency of the pulsar. So nu here is just the rotational frequency of the pulsar. Plugging all of this in then, I'm going to copy, copy this bit over to the next slide. I'm just going to tidy this up a bit and make one correction actually. So what I left out in this equation here was that amplitude tensor. Okay, so that's really important that you put that in. So we've got kind of a contraction of this detector response function here with the amplitude tensor of the gravitational wave. And I can clearly see that I've still got the original metric perturbation of my monochromatic gravitational wave. If you look at this kind of thing here, that's just the metric perturbation at the time at which the gravitational wave is passing the earth. And then this bit is the metric perturbation at the time of which the gravitational wave is passing the pulsar. So I can simplify this a little bit. I've just got two factors inside my square brackets here. I've got the metric perturbation at the time at which the gravitational wave passes the earth. And then I'm subtracting the metric perturbation at the time at which the gravitational wave originally passed the pulsar. And these pulsars are roughly a few kiloparsecs away, maybe a little bit more, uh, a little bit nearer as well. And the light travel time corresponding to a few kiloparsecs can be thousands of years, okay? So the metric perturbation is different by thousands of years of evolutionary time of the source system. So we get this echo, this imprint from an earlier time in the source dynamics in gravitational waves. And we usually just write all of this in the simplified form of delta HAB. Okay, we're done with the derivation. That's, that's one of the fundamental equations of pulsar time in arrays, that the redshift to the arrival rate of pulses as induced by gravitational waves 
is proportional to some detector response functions contracted with the difference in the metric perturbation um, at the time at which the gravitational wave is passing the Earth. And then we get our, an imprint uh, from an earlier time. Now I want to show you what this looks like. It's very, it's very easy to plug in waveforms for uh, gravitational waves coming from individual binary systems for PTAs. Uh, the binary systems we're looking at correspond to supermassive black hole binaries. Those are the binaries that are going to be emitting in, uh, in the pulsar timing band at nanohertz frequencies. Was there a question or a comment? Yeah. Yes, uh, thanks. Um, I was wondering, at the end, you sort of hid the cosines inside just a metric string. I was wondering yeah. if the formula actually turns out to be the correct one also for a generic strain, or it's sort of, uh, yeah, or it, yeah, because it, it's sort of like integrating the derivative, if you know what I mean, what I mean in the slide before. Yeah. This. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, it, it's, yes, yeah, so I did it with a specific example of a monochromatic gravitational wave, but it doesn't lose any generality because you can always decompose a metric perturbation, a gravitational wave as a sum of plane waves uh, of lots of different frequencies. And then it just becomes a linear superposition of these effects. And you can still write everything at the end as this kind of generic formula of a difference of metric perturbations. So it's a good question, but it, turns, it does turn out to be general. I see, yeah, thanks. thanks. I have one more question. Uh, can yeah. I have? yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so what's the minimum number of uh, pulsars needed to separate the polarizations? Because you mentioned about like- Separate the- Yeah, polarizations. Separate polarizations, that's a that's a really good question. Um, well, we, we don't know. Uh, to be, to be honest, um, because we haven't detected uh, the gravitational waves uh, with pulsar timing arrays quite yet. Um, but to, to do polarization discrimination, it would likely require hundreds of pulsars, um, which is not too far off in the future. Um, the square kilometer array is going to give us that many precision timed pulsars in the next decade. At the moment, um, the International Pulsar Timing Array, which brings together lots of data sets, has about 100 pulsars, um, but they're not all timed of the same length and they're not all of the same quality. So we need, we need to form an array with 100 really well-timed pulsars and um, kind of all reaching similar baselines. At the moment, we have pulsars that stretch between three years and 20 years. So we kind of need more of a parity in the observational baseline of the pulsars. Um, that's kind of a future science case for pulsar timing arrays is to discriminate the polarization content because not only do you want to actually look at the plus and the cross, you want to discriminate additional um, beyond GR polarization states if they are there. Thank you. All right, so I'm going to switch off the, the virtual blackboard now and just go back to the slides because I want to show you what the, the observations, what, what the kind of gravitational waveform would look like if we were looking at uh, pulsar timing deviations. All right. So as I said briefly, and I'll get on to more um, likely later and, and tomorrow, um, we're looking at supermassive binary black holes, the most massive black holes in the universe. These are binaries that typically are, are uh, hundreds of millions to billions of times as large as the sun, uh, emitting gravitational waves at nanohertz frequencies. Um, now, the coalescence time scale of these systems it can be millions of years, all right? So we're not going to see a merger in the pulsar time and array band. So pulsar time and arrays do not measure the merger waveform. What we do measure is the very early adiabatic in-spiral waveform. And that's great from a modeling point of view because essentially the waveform is monochromatic. The system is not evolving much over a few decades when its coalescence time scale is millions of years. Um, now, even though it's not evolving over a few decades, 
we do have to take into account that we measure the imprint of source dynamics from thousands of years in the past as well. And the system likely is evolving over thousands of years time scales. And so we have to model that and take it into account into our, into our waveform models. Okay, so this is typically what we're looking at. Along the x-axis x -axis here is modified Julian date. It's just a measurement of astronomical days. And this is over a few thousand days um, corresponding to maybe about uh, 20 years or so, or, or 10 years actually, more likely. Now this uh, y-axis is the time of arrival delay caused by gravitational waves. And it's advancing and delaying, which is why it's going positive and negative. Um, the blue dashed line here is what we call the Earth term. It's the gravitational wave imprint when it's passing the Earth. And it looks like just a monochromatic wave, very simple. We're not seeing any evolution here over about 10 years. And this is for a circular system. However, the full signal actually has this envelope, this lower frequency envelope, corresponding to a lower frequency imprint from when the source was more widely separated, from when the binary system was more widely separated. So you get this dual effect of a higher frequency oscillation from the source dynamics at this later time, encapsulated within an envelope, a lower frequency envelope from the gravitational wave um, source system dynamics at an earlier time. And that's what gives this, this very distinctive envelope behavior here. Um, now, a more interesting thing happens when you've got an eccentric system. This is, like, this is a, an E equals 0 0.5 system. And again, just focus on the blue dashed region here. This looks you know, probably what you're used to seeing where you've got this um, sudden gravitational wave burst when the system is at periapsis, when the two black holes are very close together, and then it moves around to apoapsis again. So it's kind of low frequency and then higher frequency and then low frequency and higher frequency. However, we've got an eccentric system now. This is the eccentricity at the time at which the gravitational wave passes the Earth, which means that its eccentricity at an earlier time must have been much larger. If you track it back thousands of years, it could be much larger. Um, because emission of gravitational waves causes uh, binary circularization. So over thousands of years, this system has circularized. At an earlier time, it's very eccentric. And so you get an amplification of these gravitational wave bursts and the, the, the waveform looks a lot more complicated. Um, so there's a lot of factors we have to take into account here. I would argue that this, is, this looks more complicated than, um, than a ground-based detector's chirp waveform just because of the different factors that we have to take into account and model. Um, I see there's a question on, on Zoom, go ahead. Yeah, um, so when you say that these are from, these uh, envelopes are from an earlier time, is that because these are the gravitational waves that are causing the earth to, that, to, rot to oscillate as opposed to the pulsar? Um, that's, yeah, that's a really good, if you think about this in a kind of a cartoon way, the gravitational wave comes in and it stretches and squeezes the entire space-time interval. But most of that effect integrates away and you're left with only the metric perturbation influences at the Earth and at the pulsar. And so you get this lower frequency envelope from the gravitational wave passing the pulsar. And then this higher frequency behavior, oscillatory behavior from when the gravitational wave is passing the Earth. And the time difference is just thousands of years. So that, that corresponds to the different frequency content of the, uh, of the waveform. Uh, what is the order of magnitude time to circularization, circularization for supermassive black hole mergers? Um, good question. I mean, if we were to consider this kind of system I've got on the right-hand side here where it's eccentricity of 0 0.5, um, the eccentricity at, a, at the time of the pulsar, when the gravitational wave washes over the pulsar, uh, is more like eccentricity of 0 0.9 plus. It's going to depend on the mass of the binary system. Uh, it's going to depend on the, the orbital frequency of the system, and it'll depend on the lag time between the pulsar term and the Earth term, which will be dependent on that, that distance between the Earth and the pulsar. This was only a kiloparsec distant uh, pulsar. Um, we can get a few kiloparsecs, 
Um, we're limited, obviously, by the size of our galaxy. So we're dealing with a few kiloparsecs. Um, we can get nearer than a kiloparsec as well. We can get a few hundred parsecs. So it, it can vary, but um, typically tens of thousands of years, I wouldn't say would be unreasonable. Uh, Christine, did, on, on Zoom, did you have a question? Uh, yes, so I just wanted to clarify. So is that orange um, sort of waveform like a superposition of the gravitational wave when passing the pulsar and gravitational wave when passing the Earth? Is that what it is? Yes, that's right. Okay, yeah, and what is that? What about the um, blue dot in the background? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the, the blue dashed region here, that's just, that's just the gravitational wave effect if we took into account the gravitational wave passing over the Earth. But the entire signal is delta HAB. So if you remember the formula, it's delta HAB. It's the metric perturbation of the Earth minus the metric perturbation of the pulsar. So really, I've got this blue dashed region minus another uh, curve that corresponds to the signal at the pulsar. And that gives me the red orange curve here. It's the Earth term minus the pulsar term, which gives me my entire okay. signal content. Okay, cool, thanks. Sure. Well, I think I'm um, out of time for this first lecture and I should let you all take a break before we move into the second lecture. Um, yeah, I'm happy to hand it over to Dan for anything, any announcements. Yeah, how about a 15 minute break? How does that sound to everyone? Yeah, we'll, yeah. yeah. We're back here at five of then. All right, great. Thanks, right. Steve. Thanks. Strain of the gravitational wave divided by the frequency of the gravitational wave. So we can just do h divided by 2 pi f. And if we put in uh, a strain amplitude of 10 to the minus 15, uh, a gravitational wave frequency of 10 to the minus 9 uh, hertz, uh, we get a timing deviation corresponding to a few hundred nanosecond, uh, few hundred nanoseconds, which is really, it, it's possible. It, it, seem, it seems like it would be absurdly difficult to measure that kind of timing deflection, but we can. And so that's what we hunt for. We're looking for time and deflections and deviations caused by the, the um, interaction of gravitational waves with our system. Now, we've only talked about maybe one gravitational wave source. However, um, uh, and one gravitational wave source and one pulsar. However, I mentioned that noise processes intrinsic to each pulsar make it very difficult if we were to try to claim uh, gravitational wave detection. Was there a question already? Ten to the minus fifteen is quite a large strain compared to current LIGO measurements. Um, true, but we're also dealing with much more massive systems. Um, so if we, I showed the uh, the characteristic strain diagram back at uh, at uh, the, the start of the first lecture, and so the characteristic strain of of supermassive black hole binaries is larger than the characteristic strain um, of, of stellar mass black hole systems that LIGO detects. 10 to the minus 15 is, is a reasonable number for PTAs. Um, so going back to this slide, uh, we can't just use one pulsar because we would always be wary of noise processes intrinsic to each pulsar uh, and how it might be conflated with gravitational waves. And so we don't just use one pulsar, we use an array of pulsars what you're seeing here um, is a sky map of lots of gravitational waves radiating at the same time, lots of gravitational wave sources, lots of binaries, radiating gravitational waves at the same time. These different stars are different pulsars. And so what you get in each pulsar is a superposition of timing deviations caused by all of these different gravitational wave systems, creating a stochastic gravitational wave background. So we're not just looking for one source, we're looking for the entire population of sources creating a stochastic gravitational wave background signal 
Um, and it might seem like it would be difficult to pull out that kind of signal because it doesn't have a, a waveform template. Um, that's true, but we don't look for um, these kinds of signals with waveform templates. We look for them with um, their statistical properties. So we look at the correlations of these kinds of timing deviations across the pulsars in the array. We're trying to pull out a very, very distinctive correlation signature between the different pulsars. Um, the, the analog with LIGO and Virgo and LISA would be the overlap reduction function, which is measuring the amount of power that's being shared um, between the different pairs of detectors, okay? So we're looking for really a stochastic gravitational wave background of all of these different binaries emitting at the same time. And we pull that out by looking at the correlation properties with timing deviations between the different pulsars. So we really imagine ourselves more like a spider sitting at the center of a vast galactic web. Uh, a spider can sit at the center of its web and then feel all of these different tinglings of the web and then use that to localize where its prey is. That's us, we're sitting at the center of our galaxy. We've got lots of different web strands corresponding to our Earth pulsar baselines. And we're trying to localize on the sky either where a source is coming from or measure the statistical properties of the timing deviations across all of our different web strands and measure the properties of our gravitational wave sources. And the kinds of sources we're looking for are these supermassive black hole binaries from outside of our galaxy. Okay, now I want to show you what this key observable is. I've talked about this overlap reduction function signature, this correlation signature between different pulsars. Um, I want to show you what that is. Uh, the, the spoiler is that this is the Hellings and Downs curve. If you haven't heard about that Hellings and Downs curve before, it's um, a really famous relationship for pulsar timing arrays. It shows you how the gravitational wave background signal is correlated between different pulsars and how that varies as you spread the pulsars across the sky in angular separation. Can I ask a question before we move on? Yeah, of course. Um, so you talk about the stochastic background, but I, I think you can also see single sources uh, overlaying the background, right? So mm -hmm. since they are very strong in terms of their amplitude and they're coming from a certain direction, usually quite nearby, are those signals seen only in a portion of the um, uh, of the pulsars, or do you see them? Do you see the correlation all around in all in the whole network of pulsars as well? That's a good question. Yeah, um, we would see them in we would see them in all of the pulsars to varying degrees. That's because pulsars have the a response function which is finite across you know sources coming from different parts of the sky. So even a gravitational wave on one part of the sky will still have some small sensitivity to gravitational waves coming from another side of the sky. Um, it would just be much lower than if the gravitational wave direction was close to the actual position of the pulsar. So we get highest response whenever they're kind of lined up um, and it decreases as you get further away. But we, it never goes to zero. The response is finite across the entire sky. So we'd measure the signal to varying degrees in all of our pulsars and we'd use the different response in each of our pulsars to triangulate where that source is. And can I follow up on that? So if you see the signal more strong or if you see the correlation more strongly in some of the pulsars, then how, how well are you able to pinpoint the location of the source? And can you actually uh, look for counterparts? Because these single events are actually mergers, right? They're not, uh, they're not the continuous uh, in spiral sources. No, these single these single events would be the the in spirals. So we can't see merger events in in PTA. So we can see memory events from gravitational wave mergers. So we can see the burst of memory events, which may have been measured uh, may have been talked about earlier um, in the week uh, or earlier by Alberto. Um, but we can never measure the merger waveform with PTAs. The, the, the chances of a merger happening in the PTA band are very, very small. So we're always looking for the continuous in spiral. That's not to say that we can't measure counterparts. It's just that our counterparts don't come from mergers. Our counterparts would come from, um, from 
gas that might be surrounding the individual black holes, creating some sort of variability in light curves we would measure from binary AGN. Um, this is something that your organizer, Dan DiRazio, um, is an expert on, so I'm sure he can talk about this at great length. Um, but that would be our, our counterpart. We're looking for long time scale um, kind of sinusoidal variations in light curve, um, light curves from binary AGM. And we can combine those, those kind of signatures um, of light curve variability in binary AGN with targeted gravitational wave searches um, for that particular sky location and look for the corresponding long time scale gravitational wave uh, timing deviations. Uh, did that did that answer your question? Okay. Yeah, I think so. I just thought that there was like a very high end spectrum or end of the PTA range that was actually able to ca capture some mergers, but I suppose that I misunderstood that. Um, I thought you know maybe at very high, I don't know. I thought that there was some regime where you could actually see some final inspiral mergers. But yeah. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, unfortunately not. I wish we could do that. Um, we don't have high enough frequency reach to to get up there. We're limited to maybe a few hundred nanohertz, um, and it also means that the multiband possibilities between PTAs and LISA are also kind of small uh, for for the same sources. However, we could do some sort of statistical game where we're looking at populations that span across the two. Okay, um, I see another question here in the chat relating to single sources. What is the distance reach to typical SMBH mergers for PTAs? What causes the limitation? Um, the typical distance reach, we can, we can limit the presence of any single sources out to uh, maybe a few hundred megaparsecs for 10 to the nine solar mass systems and a few gigaparsecs for um, 10 to the 10 solar mass binary systems. Um, so if there were any, if there were any binary systems that were 10 to the nine solar masses um, that were closer than a few hundred megaparsecs, then Nanograv and the IPTA would have discovered them already. Likewise, if there were any binary systems that have uh, a mass of 10 to the 10 solar masses and it were any closer than 5.5 gigaparsecs, then Nanograv and its most recent search would have found those. Um, now the caveat to that is there is a large kind of sky directional sensitivity. We're sensitive to gravitational waves aligned with where our pulsars mostly are, and we're least sensitive to where they're absent. So we have large patches of the sky that aren't covered. So there's a big variation in that sensitivity, but roughly speaking, uh, we, can, we could detect things that are closer than half a gigaparsec. Andre, did you have another question? Or Andre? Yeah. Just, yeah, quick question. The reason that, is the reason that we can't get more sensitive or get sensitive in higher frequencies with pulsar timing arrays because we don't have clocks that are that precise, like earth clocks, or is there another physical reason for the limit in band? Yeah, it's, it's mostly because um, we're limited by how often we sample the time series of the pulsars. What typically happens is <clears throat> we're, we're We've got some time on a radio telescope. We swivel our telescope around to look at a particular pulsar and we take observations for 30 minutes and that gives us millions of pulses. And we stack all of those together and we create sort of a, an observation averaged pulse and we measure how offset that is from our models. Um, now we can't get time to do that every single day for every single pulsar. So we can only do this every couple of weeks. That means that we're only sensitive to gravitational waves um, at inverse uh, over a few weeks. So we've got one over a few weeks high frequency sensitivity, which if you work it out, corresponds to a few hundred nanohertz. The, the smaller the time scale that we go back to each pulsar and measure the next observation, that will boost our higher frequency sensitivity. So if we can measure pulses every single day um, that would bring us up to close to a microhertz. And if we could get every, every single hour, that would boost it even higher. We might even not actually sure what the overlap frequency would be with LISA, um, but it would have to be a very short time scale for these observations. Um, that's unlikely to ever happen. 
uh, we wouldn't be able to get the time to do that. So we're mostly limited to a band that's set by how often we're able to get observation time on each pulsar. All right, I'm gonna move on now to show you where the, the Hellings and Downs curve, this overlap reduction function signature between uh, different pulsars comes from. I'm gonna truncate the math quite a lot because um, I don't wanna take, um, take you away from afternoon discussions more than I have to. Also, I'd like to get onto the enterprise tutorial. Um, key to all of this is that we're going to approximate uh, the metric perturbation of a stochastic gravitational wave background as a superposition of plane gravitational waves of lots of different uh, frequencies and coming from different parts in the sky. So I should share my screen here. Okay, now you might've seen this kind of equation before. This is the metric perturbation from a superposition of plane gravitational waves uh, where it contains both plus and cross modes, contains lots of different frequencies coming from lots of different positions on the sky. And then you've got polarization amplitudes. So this is the polarization amplitude of the a polarization of gravitational waves at a particular frequency. Uh, coming from a particular direction on the sky. This is just complex exponential. And then these are polarization basis tensors. And I'm sure this might've been, uh, this might've come up on Monday in the, the gravitational wave theory portion. So these are just basis tensors that we describe our gravitational wave metric perturbation on. Um, again, I'll say that if the math goes too quickly here, don't worry, all of this is going to be up afterwards. So if it's easier for you to see uh, and just watch this and follow afterwards, that's totally fine as well. So N is, I'm going to call this the gravitational wave propagation direction. EAB is a polarization basis tensor. HA, corresponding polarization amplitude. All right, so now for pulsar timing arrays, what I'm really interested in is not just HAB, I'm interested in the delta HAB, the difference in the metric perturbation between the earth and the pulsar, because that's what my observables depend on. So I'm going to need, need to describe that in the Fourier domain, because I'm going to describe all the statistical quantities in the Fourier domain here. So let me write delta HAB Delta HAB is going to be um, related to the quantity on the right-hand side here. Um, essentially, this is the Earth term and this is the, the pulsar term. I've done a subtraction of two metric perturbation quantities here. Um, you can do that yourself in your own time. It's not that difficult to do. You just take the formula that I had on this side and you plug in quantities from the first lecture and you get the Delta HAB corresponding to the Earth term minus the pulsar term. Now, if I move this into the Fourier domain, I'm just gonna use tildes to correspond to the Fourier domain. That's going to be e to the minus two pi i FL, where L is the distance of the pulsar, one plus omega dot P minus one. And I've got the sum over polarizations. <clears throat> 
and polarization basis tensors. Okay, so that's the metric perturbation uh, delta HAB in the Fourier domain. So in order to get the Fourier domain version of the redshift to the pulse arrival rates, I just need to contract this delta HAB with the detector response functions. And I'm going to write that just using terms from this equation above here. So we get this bit, we get a sum HA at omega, Let me clean up that a bit. And then we get a capital F, uppercase F, which depends on the direction of propagation of gravitational waves. Now, how did we get from polarization basis tensor up here to this uppercase F? And what does that uppercase F actually mean? The uppercase F is the antenna response function for pulsed star timing arrays. So LIGO, Virgo, CAGRA, they have their, uh, polar, they have their um, antenna response functions, the directional sensitivity to different parts of the sky and different sources. LISA has detector response functions. Um, pulsar time arrays have an equivalent response function. And it'll look very similar to before. So you've got these directional sensitivity components. And then it's just contracted with the polarization basis tensor of whatever polarization you care about. So that's true for all gravitational wave detectors. The antenna response function is the contraction of the detector response function, which is this bit, with the polarization basis tensors. That gives you your uppercase F. So that's true regardless of what gravitational wave detector you've got. The only part that's going to change for different gravitational wave detectors is the form of this detector response function. And this is the version for pulsar time and arrays. Now, as I started saying at the, at the top of this lecture, pulsar timing arrays are more likely to first detect a stochastic gravitational wave background than they are to detect individual sources. Um, so we need to have some way of describing the statistical properties of this stochastic background, because that's how we're going to hunt for these gravitational wave signals. A stochastic gravitational wave background, or an SGWB, is described in terms of its um, statistical properties. And we're going to characterize it as a Gaussian stationary unpolarized background. It's going to be a zero mean process, which means that we can describe all of its statistics entirely in terms of its variance. So we're going to look at the variance of the, the polarization amplitude described the background. And the variance of these modes is just H multiplied by its conjugate for a different polarization amplitude, a different gravitational wave frequency and a different source direction. And then we're just going to look at the quadratic expectation value of those quantities. Because I'm treating this as a Gaussian stationary and unpolarized background, then each of the polarizations is statistically independent different source directions are statistically independent. And different frequencies are statistically independent as well. We get that from a stationarity argument. And then we multiply all of this by SH of F, which is the one-sided power spectral density of the Fourier modes described in the background. All of these are chronic air deltas. Okay, so I'm going to use this quadratic expectation value of the Fourier modes to correlate 
the redshift of the Apulsa rival rid from different pulsars. So notice I've got a subscript I there, which is pulsar I. I'm going to correlate this with the pulse arrival rate, pulsar J. And let's see what we get. So we're going to get something that looks like complicated double integral that we're going to make a lot easier, but I'm going to show you the full thing. So integral over the unit sphere twice, because I'm correlating two quantities that have uh, unit sphere integrals in them. So I've, got, so I've got D2 omega, D2 omega prime. And then I've got these exponential factors for pulsar i. in direction pi minus one. I've got another of these factors for pulsar j. Don't worry if you don't get all of this down. And then I've got a factor which looks like it's related to the quadratic expectation value thing that we just worked out. Okay, that seems like a lot. Uh, there's a lot going on here, but I can relate this to just the power spectral density of the pulsar, the pulsar rival rates. So I know this has to be related to some sort of signal um, measured power spectral density between pulsars I and J. So it's the cross power spectral density between pulsars I and J. None of this is particularly special to PTAs. This is true in stochastic background searches in LIGO and MISA as well. Okay, now I'm gonna make things a lot easier. I'll start getting rid of terms. So this quadratic expectation value, the correlation of uh, ZI with ZJ, um, can be written as half delta F minus F prime. Remember the delta F minus F prime means we're talking about a stationary background where different frequencies are statistically independent of each other. That's going to be related to, related to the power spectral density of the Fourier modes. I'll then have an integral over the sky. I'm able to collapse one of my sky integrals because I'm dealing with a statistically independent background. So the different directions of the sky are not correlated with each other. So I can use my Kronecker deltas, all of those terms that I had in the previous equations to collapse some of the integrals and make this a lot easier. I've got a variable in here, kappa, that I'll explain pretty soon. A is summing over polarizations. And then clearly I've got some sort of product here of these antenna response functions. So I've got the sum of the product of the antenna response functions for pulsar i and j. That kappa factor, kappa ij, contains all of those messy exponential terms from pulsar i and j. I'm not gonna write all of this out, but it contains all of those messy uh, complex exponentials. And we can approximate those complex exponentials just as washing out 
Okay, so they very they oscillate very very quickly on the sky, and uh, we're dealing with very low frequencies but very distant pulsars. So for for most purposes, kappa is two when the pulsars are equivalent to each other. So I'm just taking the same pulsar and correlating it with itself. If it's not the same pulsar that I'm correlating with itself, then it's equal to one. So when the pulsars are not equal, I only get a factor of one being kappa. But if it's two, sorry, but if it's the same pulsar, then I get a doubling of this factor of kappa that becomes two. So let's recap a little bit. This is the quadratic expectation value of the pulse arrival rates in the Fourier domain from different pulsars. So I'm correlating one pulsar's information with another. I'm dealing with a Gaussian stationary unpolarized background. So all of the double integral factors and double sum factors over polarization and over, um, over sky integrals can collapse a little bit. So I can use the Kronecker deltas to collapse some of those integrals. I only get single integrals and single sums then. And I've still got this delta F minus F prime factor because I've got um, a, a stationary background where the frequency information is independent. And this is the power spectral density of the Fourier amplitudes of the gravitational wave background. Now I've got this interesting factor here, which is the sum of the product of the antenna response functions. If you're familiar with gravitational wave detector theory, you'll see that this is related to the overlap reduction function. So this is the overlap in the antenna sensitivities of your different detectors. So I'm going to call this gamma tilde between pulsars I and pulsars J. It's an integral over the sky. and then a sum over the different polarizations of FA I and FA J. Okay, so I've just got these antenna response functions from different pulsars, multiplying them together, summing them over different polarizations, and then integrating over the sky. And that's going to be rela related to the overlap reduction function for my detector. Essentially, the overlap in sensitivity between different detectors. Rahul, yes, you can treat kappa as that. It's two when it's the same pulsar, it's one when it's uh, only one pulsar. Uh, that's different from another one. Now you could plug in you could plug in the antenna response function that we calculated for PTAs. You could plug in some of the um, polarization basis tensors and work that out explicitly. And then you could do the math on this and it's going to be tedious, but it's going to be easy. It just requires a bit of contour integration, but I'm going to give you it directly. Um, it's equal to xij log of xij minus a sixth of xij plus a third where xij is equal to a half, one minus cosine theta ij. What does this mean? This is, the, this is the original form of the Hellings and Downs curve, which is the overlap reduction function for PTAs. It tells you how much power is shared between different pulsars, the degree of correlation between pulsar timing deviations as the pulsars are spread across the sky. Theta ij is the angular separation between pulsars on the sky. And I'll show you what this looks like pretty soon, but essentially as you separate pulsars in the sky, the degree of correlation of the gravitational wave information decreases and then increases again. And that's because the gravitational wave response is quadrupolar. So the form of the Hellings and Downs curve, the form of this equation that you'll actually see in most papers um, looks like this. It's normalized so that it's equal to one at zero angular separation between the pulsars. Um, 
And Rahul, this is um, this is the form that uh, you mentioned for that Kronecker. We've got that delta ij. Okay, so if I've got the same pulsar, if I've got the same pulsar, that's going to add in a little bit of extra. So it's going to double the correlation between between the gravitational wave time and deviations. If I've got different pulsars, then the maximum form that this takes is going to be 0 0.5. So what it will look like is, if I've got theta angular separation along the x-axis, and I've got gamma along the y-axis, gamma is just a measure of the correlation between the pulsar information uh, in different pulsars. If I've got the same pulsar, it's going to be one. But if I've got different pulsars, the maximum is going to be a 0 0.5. It's going to decrease and then increase again. It won't come back to 0 0.5. It'll come back to 0 0.25. And this is close to 90 degrees. This is going to be 180 degrees. Okay, so this is the Hellings and Downs curve. Very, very famous in PTAs. It underpins all of our stochastic background searches because we're looking for this signature of correlations between our pulsars. So whenever you're reading a pulsar time and array paper um, that's talking about detection of the stochastic background, this is going to be one of the sort of cornerstone uh, quantities that it's going to be based on. So let me show you what this looks like uh, in more detail. I know we're getting short on time, so I'll just take a few more minutes. Okay, so here's that Hellings and Downs curve in more detail. On the left-hand side, on the y-axis, we've got the, the actual function value itself, which is the degree of correlation between the different time of arrival deviations in the different pulsars. Um, it's 0 0.5 for different pulsars as a maximum, and then decreases smoothly uh, until we get to a minimum value of about minus 0 0.15, and then increases up again to 0 0.25 for pulsars on opposite sides of the sky. The reason why it doesn't come back to 0 0.5 is because we have an almost quadrupolar antenna response, but it's not perfectly quadrupolar. In fact, our antenna response has that one over one plus omega dot p factor, which introduces a preferred direction in our experiment. Preferred direction is that we're most sensitive to gravitational waves propagating along the same direction as the unit vector of the pulsars. So that's a preferred direction and introduces some non-quadrupolar behavior into this. In fact, if we tried to decompose this curve onto some Legendre polynomials and look at the kind of multipolar content of this curve, um, we would get this kind of shape. So this is fitting a Legendre series to the Hellings and Downs curve and looking at the quadrupolar behavior and higher multipole behavior. Uh, we get no information in the monopole, which is a flat line, or a dipole, which is just going to be a cosine. We get a huge excess in the quadrupolar. That's because this curve um, is mostly quadrupolar. But then we get a long tail, tail to higher multipoles, which explains, um, it explains why this doesn't come back to 0 0.5. It goes to 0 0.25. Got some higher multipole behavior as well. OK, so that's where the Hellings and Downs curve comes from. If you've ever wondered, or if you ever see it, it you can just equate it to the overlap reduction function for LIGO and LISA. It's just the PTA equivalent of that. And it tells you the degree of correlation that the gravitational wave signal is imparting between different pulsars as a function of the angular separation. Now, I think we're pretty much done on time for, for this lecture. Um, I just wanted to leave you with some practical information about who's doing these kinds of searches. Um, so I'm a member of NANOGRAV, which is the North American Nanohertz Observatory for Gravitational Waves. We mostly use information from the Green Bank Telescope in West Virginia, and um, we used to use the Arecibo telescope in Puerto Rico before sadly it, uh, it uh, collapsed recently. But we still got a huge amount of legacy information from the Arecibo telescope, which is going to be really important for our searches uh, in years and decades to come.
So this is a low frequency experiment. So any data that we had from years ago is still relevant and still informs our searches today. Nanograv um, is also partnered with uh, collaborations in Europe, European Pulsar Time and Array, uh, of which I used to be a member. So I did my, my PhD and, and undergrad in, in the UK. Uh, these are just a small collection of telescopes that uh, Europe has access to. And then in Australia, there's the Parkes Pulsar Time and Array as well. We have some emerging collaborations in South Africa, uh, in India, and in China. In fact, happy to report that the Indian PTA is now an official member of a collaboration we call the International Pulsar Time and Array. The International Pulsar Time and Array is a joint effort that combines data from Nanograv, from the European Pulsar Time and Array, from the Parks Pulsar Time and Array, and from the Indian Pulsar Time and Array. We're all working together to fuse our data sets together in order to get to detection faster. Um, I think that's where I'll leave you with today. Uh, I could go on, but I want to get to the enterprise tutorial um, and I'll talk about more of the details of the sources and the kind of cutting edge topics um, to, at tomorrow's cutting edge lecture. So shall we take a quick break? Or are you planning to go right into the lecture, Steve? I mean. How about we take a quick five minute break so I can yeah. get set up with the, uh, the notebook. Okay, so let's take five minutes and we'll come back for the enterprise session. Thanks again, Steve. Right. Thanks everyone.